Many thanks, uh, Alessandro, for your words of introduction, and many thanks also to uh, the uh, uh, rector of, uh, of the Polytechnic, and also to the remarks of, uh, of uh, the, the previous speaker. It's a great pleasure to be here. This is indeed my first time in Torino, uh, at least as an adult, and I'm most impressed by the city, and I've also been shown around the Politecno uh, this morning by Alessandro, and I'm very impressed by, by the, uh, the, the institution as a, as a whole. Um, and many thanks for being invited here. Uh, this is more than I expected, really, it's particularly in this sort of room. Uh, just amazing. Uh, as you'll see, there's, a, there's an historical element in my talk, uh, already symbolized by the mammoth pictured there, which is my only PowerPoint slide. I'm not a great fan of PowerPoint. I prefer talking and people listening to me rather than looking at pictures, but I have this one picture there to, to take away or, or hopefully symbolize the epitome of, of the, the message that I'm to deliver today. Note that I, unlike most of you, am a native English speaker, so I am at an advantage. I'm holding my talk in English. I'm aware that many of you will struggle with some of the terminology, so I will make an effort to speak clearly. But being originally an Australian, uh, I have a tendency to start to slur my words, in other words, mumble a bit, uh, because of a childhood in an environment with many flies. So uh, I will battle that tendency, and please, if any of you have problems understanding me, I will not find it at all rude if you please stop me and say, can you express yourself a little more clearly, please? I'm also going to ask at least one question along the way, uh, because I do like dialogue, but I am also aware that many Italian students are quite polite and don't like to ask questions, let alone make comments, so I'm not expecting many hands to be raised in answer to my question, but stay tuned, there will be a question coming. Now, why this picture? This picture, as I said, is of a mammoth. It's actually of a North American mastodon uh, that died out between 10 and 8,000 years ago. Well, I believe that this mammoth epitomizes the reform process that the European Union is undergoing when it comes to data protection. It's a very uh, fundamental process. It touches on many, many aspects of the current data protection regime. It's also a slow-moving process, a cumbersome process, and I think the, 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 the mammoth symbolizes it, it very well. It's also very reminiscent of one of the main elements of the process, and that is the element that I'm going to be focusing on uh, quite a bit in, in the following half an hour or so, and that is a proposal for a new data protection regulation, or a general data protection regulation. It's a proposal that will end up, if it's adopted, replacing a directive on data protection that was passed back in 1995. In other words, roughly two decades ago. And the proposed regulation is, in some respects, quite different to the current directive. It is, in the first place, much, much larger. It has 91 articles, at least the original proposal that was issued by the European Commission about two years ago, January 2012. 91 articles, whereas the current directive has just over 30. Many of the 91 articles also have multiple clauses. So um, 
the, the, the 91 number could be bumped up to well into the hundreds if one divided some of those articles up uh, into further articles. In addition, the preamble, I'm not sure what the, the Italian term is, preamble, that consists of 139 recitals or paragraphs. So we are talking about a mastodon of a legal instrument. Uh, it's not a lithe-moving saber-toothed tiger. It is very much a mammoth. Now, the proposal for a new general data protection regulation is one of two primary prongs of reform. There is also a proposal to replace a framework decision regarding data protection within the police sector with a new directive that will also deal with data processing done by the police sector. And the main element of the proposed reform when it comes to policing is to introduce data privacy or data protection rules that will apply to intra-state processing by police agencies of personal data. The current framework decision uh, passed by the EU back in 2008 only deals with data protection in relation to tr data, personal data being passed between, between police agencies in different member states. So if the, the new proposed directive in this area uh, gets enacted, then again we will have fairly, fairly fundamental change with regard to the policing sector. So far there hasn't been a great deal of at least public controversy around the police sector changes. Most of the debate has focused on this creature here, or rather the proposed general data protection regulation. And uh, we still don't know the exact outcome of the reform process. At the moment, there is a renewed push with the new commission members having just been given their posts and a new president uh, having just been appointed. There is now a new push to get this data reform, uh, data protection reform package basically uh, clarified in the spring of next year. Um, I think that's optimistic, uh, but nonetheless I do think there will be a very serious concerted effort made to introduce much more clarity into the reform process, certainly by June of next year. That's not to say that the dust will have settled completely or that we'll be able to see all of the myriad contours of the new framework, but we'll get a fairly good idea of the rough shape of the new framework. How am I going language-wise? Are you, are you able to follow, basically? Uh, it's a good, good, okay. The... Um, General Data Protection Directive, or the proposal for such a, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation, rather, uh, or the proposed regulation, has been controversial, uh, partly because it introduces new rights, or it makes existing rights more stringent. For example, there is a much more stringent right to erase uh, or rectify personal data that is held by uh, data controllers. That's a right that has sometimes been named as the right to be forgotten, a somewhat uh, misleading nomenclature in my opinion, uh, but that's the, the way in which the European Commission first described this enhanced right of data erasure. And that's probably been the most controversial of the rights, particularly from a transatlantic perspective with both US government officials and many US companies aghast at this proposed right to be forgotten. Indeed, one US government official even threatened a new trade war were the original proposal for this enhanced right of data erasure to be adopted in its uh, original form. 
But there are other uh, rights that are also worth mentioning. I'm not going to go through all of these in great detail because A, we don't have time, and B, I appreciate that many of you in, in, in this audience are not lawyers and, uh, and uh, we could quickly end up giving a rather confusing uh, picture of the reform process. So I'm, I'm going to basically keep to the, the big picture, as it were, rather than delve into the many, many trees of the forest. But there are, for example, new requirements of uh, data protection by design and by default. In other words, an obligation on data controllers to hardwire, as it were, data protection norms into the development of information systems. And I mention that right particularly because we are, uh, this is, this is a, a symposium organized by the, the, the Politecnico di Torino, where many of you are engineers. So the language of the proposed regulation is speaking at the engineering community, particularly those developed in information systems development. And it's saying basically, you have to hardwire data protection into systems development from an early stage. It just can't be an add-on feature that comes in at the last moment, if at all. So that's, that's one, one example, I think, of a uh, fairly important new requirement that will flow from this reform process. Um, there are also new obligations on controllers and processes of personal data, personal data to carry out ex ante data protection impact assessments, particularly of risky processing operations. There are new obligations on controllers to notify uh, both data protection authorities and data subjects of breaches of security relating to personal data. There are stronger sanctions to be imposed on controllers and processes of personal data. And there are greater documentary requirements on both controllers and processes of personal data. So there is a lot there in the proposal for a new general data protection regulation that at least if implemented, if, if more than just paper, uh, will have a significant impact on organizational processes. But as I said, we, we don't know uh, how much of these new requirements will end up being adopted in the final and, dare I say, frenetic negotiations that will go on through the rest of this autumn, through the winter, and well into next year. Uh, another element of uncertainty is that some of the articles in the proposed regulation are, in a sense, left empty. They are left to the Commission to uh, develop new and more detailed rules for particular sectors or kinds of data processing. One example of such a sector is, for example, scientific research. Uh, so for, for those of you in the scientific research community, there is a great deal of uncertainty as to exactly what the data, reform, the data protection reform process will lead to. It goes without saying that, that the reform process, or the, the reform proposals at least, taken as a whole are extremely ambitious. And they involve far more than a cosmetic makeover of the current regulatory framework. Some commentators have gone so far as to just characterize them as a root and branch revision of the law or the end of the beginning. I don't think uh, those sort of characterizations are completely accurate because much of the reform process is also carrying on uh, and elaborating principles that we already have. So there is no fundamental break with the current regulatory framework. It's just that the proposed framework will become much bigger, much more detailed, much more uniform, at least on paper, there will be less flexibility to adjust that framework uh, 
at the national and sub-national level. Um, and um, there is also a danger that the, the whole reform process may, in a sense, trip over itself. But I'll come back to that later on in my speech. So this reform process started off in about 2012, at least formally, although there were some, uh, some discussions uh, around this process from uh, a little bit before 2012. The question I want to ask you is that what has changed over the two decades or so since the current directive was adopted. The current directive was adopted back in 1995, and the first proposal for the current directive was indeed issued five years before, that is in 1990. So from the early 90s up until now, what has changed? What, what, what's been the most fundamental change? Any takers? I agree. That's, uh, in my opinion, probably the most fundamental change, the development of the internet. Well, now, the mass deployment of the internet, because the internet was, in fact, already invented um, by the early 90s, but the big change has been its deployment from outside its academic chrysalis, as it were, uh, into uh, a ubiquitous communications platform. And along with the, the rollout of the internet, we've had the development of an internet economy uh, and all the various actors that are connected to that internet economy. And we have uh, two representatives of companies involved in that internet economy uh, to uh, contribute to this symposium a little bit later on. So yeah, I'd, I'd agree, the internet is probably the, the most fundamental change. And then the question becomes, well, has the reform process started in four, three or four, five years ago, has that taken adequate account of the internet? Well, the European Commission would argue, yes, it has, that the the, the proposal for a new general data protection regulation is um, very much a proposal with the internet in mind, that it is an uh, attempt, an explicit attempt, to safeguard the right to privacy in the online age. And there are quite a few provisions within the proposed general data protection regulation that do have the internet in mind. Um, on the other hand, other commentators would say, well, no, um, the internet is not adequately accounted for in this new proposed uh, regulation. I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of that debate, but it is certainly a debate that is alive and uh, one that won't be concluded in the near future. There have been other changes as well. For the lawyers amongst you who, has, who are relatively specialized in the field of human rights uh, and even more specialized in the field of data protection, probably the most fundamental change would be, and here I'm going to put Alessandro on the spot, what would you say has been the major change in the field of data protection law over the last two decades? And I'm thinking in Europe not in the US of A, because there is a big difference here. It's a difficult question. <laughs> I think that uh, the, the main change is the shifting from the traditional approach based on the idea of self-determination to the idea of uh, using, creating a system that is privacy-oriented, so reducing the role of uh, self-determination and increasing the role of uh, the accountability. But uh, at the same time, I think that uh, new proposal is still too, too focused, in my opinion, on the 
paradigm of you know, these incomes and those self determination. So this is, uh, mm. I think, I, this is, I think it's, this is the change. Mm. It's too complex, too complicated, and uh, uh, this is, I think, the new issues uh, related to something that in nineties and eighties, uh, when you provide your information, you could have a, an idea of what uh, it means, the notice, and what in what in which way the, your information will be used. Now, when uh, you have access to some services, uh, you don't know, you don't, uh, uh, you're not able to understand. And so this changing, I can, this is, uh, is interesting and uh, it's a new challenge, in my mm. opinion. I, I would agree with you, but it wasn't the answer I was after. <laughs> the answer I was thinking of is that data protection has become firmly recognized as a fundamental right in itself. Would you agree? Yeah. I agree. I think that, uh, and uh, I quote uh, Victor Mayer Schoenberg in his uh, generation on data protection. Um, I think that also in the past, uh, there was this idea of uh, connection between data protection in the second and third generation recalling the article of Victor, uh, there was this approach uh, that uh, link uh, put together the aspect of protection information and the fundamental rights. Maybe now this aspect is more relevant because not, uh, it's not only a theoretical <coughs> debate among uh, legal scholars, but we see the impact uh, in terms of society. So in many countries, uh, information are used uh, to control people, information are used to limit access to service to internet and so on. So what was the uh, um, consideration coming from the legal uh, uh, academia now I think is also uh, a real issue that comes from uh, the world uh, around us. Mm. The emergence of data protection as a fundamental right in itself um, is something that has been catalyzed by the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg uh, from the late 1980s or perhaps even going back to the late 1970s indeed. We see in the jurisprudence from the European Court of Human Rights an increasing recognition that data protection guarantees are part and parcel of the traditional right to respect for private life in Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. But uh, data protection in the, in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights has been always connected to this traditional right to respect for private life. The EU, however, uh, has taken data protection and given it its own feet independently of the traditional right to respect for private life. And we see this formalized in Article 8 of the European Charter of Fundamental Rights from 2000. And also concretized by the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union. So I think the, the rather unique contribution of the EU in this area has been to establish data protection as a fundamental human right in itself. And that, I think, is very significant for the overall development of this area of law and policy in Europe. And it also has implications for the global picture of data protection. Now, note that no other region in the world has gone as far as the EU in making data protection a fundamental right in itself. Uh, the US of A certainly hasn't gone that far. In the US legal system, it is the right to free speech that is at the apex of the human rights hierarchy. Uh, data protection is uh, at the most a sort of second order right, but it's rarely, rarely uh, the case that data protection interests will trump the right to free speech in the US of A. And that's the case with many other countries around the world outside 
of Europe. Uh, and what's happened is that the, uh, the, the important role played by the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg in this area has gradually been uh, not, re not necessarily reduced, but certainly marginalized to some extent by the developing jurisprudence or case law of the European, uh, of the, the Court of Justice of the EU. Because the Court of Justice of the EU is now increasingly ready to apply data protection as a fundamental right and a right that therefore uh, trumps or, or, or is not at least easily trumped by other fundamental rights. And it means that the fate of the EU data reform, data protection reform process is now very much tied to the mast of the jurisprudence of the EU court. And the jurisprudence of the EU court has recently not been loosening the ties, but rather tightening the ties of the reform process uh, to, to this mast. The most recent example of this happening is a judgment handed down in May of this year that I'm sure all of you have heard about, if not read about. It's the judgment in the case of um, uh, Google and um, Mr. Mario Gonzalez, uh, or Mario Costella Gonzalez. This is the case dealing with the so-called right to be forgotten. Again, a misleading nomenclature for this particular case decision. But uh, you'll, you'll recall that this was a case where Mr. Costella Gonzalez had been involved in bankruptcy proceedings back in the 1990s. Uh, a local newspaper had reported on these proceedings and later when the newspaper came out in an online edition, uh, the reports that were originally offline then became online and hence searchable by, amongst others, Google. And Mr. Gonzalez protested to Google saying, hey, you know, why should search results linked to my name bring up these insolvency or bankruptcy proceedings that are from the 1990s and are now inaccurate and irrelevant for characterization of me? Uh, Google protested and said, hey, we're, we're just, we're just a, a relatively value neutral uh, search engine. Um, you know, we, we have no responsibility for the personal data that emerges as a result of, of uh, putting in search words related to pe particular people's names. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez was not happy with this response, so he initiated litigation. The litigation went all the way to the Court of Justice of the European Union, and the Court of Justice of the European Union basically said, in this case, uh, a, Google is a controller of the personal data, so it's not just a, a processor. Uh, it needs to take responsibility for the personal data that emerge as a result of the um, search results. And um, interestingly, the court also viewed Google's economic interests as secondary to the data protection rights of the persons who figure in search engine results. Again, underlining the fact that data protection is a fundamental right and as such trumps easily then economic or mere economic interests. And uh, in this particular case then, uh, Mr. Gonzalez was able to get a, a court order uh, that insisted on suppressing uh, certain of the search engine results related to his name. And now Google is faced with tens of thousands of, of these sorts of requests for uh, de-indexation. I think that's the better, the better term to use. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not imposition of a right to be forgotten. It's rather imposition of a right to have certain search engine results uh, suppressed or to be de-indexed. Uh, although, as you can appreciate, uh, 
um, applying this right to de-indexation does indirectly at least promote an interest in being forgotten. So obviously this case has caused a great deal of controversy, uh, both in Europe, but even more so across the Atlantic in the US of A, where free speech, as I said, usually would, uh, would, would trump the sort of interest that Mr. Gonzalez uh, has in, uh, in this sort of case. Um, but this is not the first time in which the Court of Justice of the European Union has fired across the path of internet-related technology deployment. Two years earlier, back in 2012, it shot down two proposals in Belgium to employ so-called deep packet inspection aimed at preventing copyright infringement through peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. And it found that these proposals for deep packet inspection failed to strike a proportionate and fair balance between the various rights concerned. The, the Gonzalez or Google case though is the first time that the Court of Justice has fired directly at a well-established, commonly used internet mechanism. Um, now the interesting thing with these cases is not just so, not, not just the result, but the reasoning of the court. What it is in basically doing is carrying out proportionality assessments. So it's looking at a particular instance of data processing and asking, is this processing of personal data proportionate in relation to the ends or the purposes of the processing? Um, and in many ways, this sort of proportionality assessment is taking over as a fundamental driver in data protection law, at least in Europe. And one can question whether the mammoth here that symbolizes this huge, huge, and perhaps unwieldy proposal for a general data protection regulation, whether some of it, the size, could be reduced simply by greater application of case-by-case -case proportionality assessments. Because there is, a, there is a, a drive among some people in the data protection community to simplify the law. And they say that the mammoth that the proposed general data protection regulation uh, has become, that, that's, that's the wrong direction to be taking this field of law. It's simply making the law more unwieldy, more cumbersome. It's taking it away from the community and placing it more and more in the hands of specialists like myself and like Alessandro and some of the others here in this room. Uh, it's making it less transparent and understandable for the average data subject. And maybe the answer could be, and I'm throwing this out as a, as a general point of discussion, uh, maybe one could reduce the size of that beast by relying more on the sort of proportionality assessments that the Court of Justice of the EU is applying. Some commentators would also say that uh, like the mammoth, which became extinct, that this field of law as well uh, faces extinction. Uh, or at least that it's simply a case of tilting at windmills. Uh, in Australian, we'd say it's pissing into the wind. So, you know, you, you, it looks all great on paper, but really, it's business as usual. Uh, it, it's, it's merely facade, it's symbolic, this, this field of law. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a pessimist, uh, or I'm not, I don't share that sort of pessimism to the same degree. I do see that the field of data protection law, at least in Europe, is alive, and it is kicking, and it is doing so to a large extent because of the courts, which, uh, which are um, applying this sort of fundamental rights jurisprudence to make sure that data protection interests do get respected in 
information systems development and information systems employment. So I'm, I'm not at all convinced that the symbol of the mammoth is necessarily a symbol of the future of this area of law. Okay, that's pretty much all I want to say, except finally to say that the reform process is a marathon. It's not a sprint. This was, a, this was something said by some colleagues of mine a year or so ago, and I think it's important to remember that. This is not going to be over fast. Uh, this is this, this is, we are mi midway in a, in a fairly long process, and the dust has still yet to settle around that process, and it will be a long time before the dust does settle around this process. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the more general discussion ensuing. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, for this uh, analysis. Uh, it's a very interesting, <clears throat> and uh, I totally agree with uh, the problem of the mammoth. And uh, I, I think that uh, also if we consider the technological evolution and the new issues that emerge the year by year or month by month, uh, now regulation based on uh, principle is uh, more useful sometimes than a uh, too detailed regulation. And, uh, and now I open to the floor for question. Adesso chiederò a voi se avete delle domande, le potete formulare sia in italiano che in inglese, non c'è nessun problema. È un'opportunità, sottolineo soprattutto, oltre che per gli esperti della materia, soprattutto per eh, gli studenti, eh, di avere un eh, esperto, un grande esperto europeo su questo tema che potrà rispondervi, ancorché voi abbiate una conoscenza in generale del tema, però tutti, bene o male, un po' di privacy, abbiamo, abbiamo una nostra esperienza che può essere eh, navigare su internet, eh, vedere un sito e dopo due minuti andare su un altro sito e rivedere il banner che ci dice che ho guardato, il, io ad esempio sono perseguitato da alcuni giorni dal mio li, libro che adotto di nozioni giuridiche perché ho avuto la malgurata occasione di andare a vedere se c'era un'ultima edizione, adesso tutte le volte mi vedo il libro di nozioni giuridiche, potete capire qual è l'impatto negativo. <ride> Eh, detto questo, quindi penso ci possano essere delle domande. Eh, siccome c'è un microfono, chi vuole fare una domanda alza la mano, porterò il microfono. Ripeto, fatela anche in italiano, in inglese, come preferite. Um, I have a question for you, <laughs> uh, so I give time to, to students and to other people to, to prepare their own question. And uh, my question is, uh, is about a topic that uh, is uh, in the field of my interest in, in the last period. Is, uh, is big data, and uh, I think that uh, big data creates some problems uh, with the traditional approach used uh, by data protection regulation in general, and I think that uh, also the new proposal is still uh, not mainly, but uh, in a large part, focused on the traditional approach. So the purpose limitation principle, the minimization, and the notice and consent were uh, recognized as a ground for this uh, regulation are some problems that uh, are some elements that don't deal with the new context of, uh, of big data. And at the same time, so there's a question inside of the question. At the same time, I think that um, also some technical solution or some approach, I, I think, to uh, anonymization, de-identification, de and so on, are still focused on the traditional idea, not only the traditional forms of protection, but also the traditional idea of privacy. You, in your book, in a chapter of your uh, book on data protection, talk about group privacy. So I think that the big players, but also big governments, and big players and big governance, make a, a lot of use of personal information to know how group acts without an interest if the name is uh, Costera Gonzalez or another name. They are not interested in many cases on the specific individual identity, but on the group 
And uh, from this perspective, uh, anonymization, artisan council, and awards that don't work so much. And so what do you think about these new, new, new issues related to the analysis of groups in a big data, or if you prefer, uh, in an internet of things, uh, in a, an environment rich of information about us and our movement, our interaction, in which, uh, in many cases, we don't know who collected data and uh, Oh, they clusterize our information, in which group we are part of it. Thanks. Well, I, I totally agree that big data analytics creates some serious challenges for applying basic data protection principles. And you mentioned the principle of purpose limitation. Uh, that's a principle that basically says that when you process personal data, you are to do so with a specified purpose in mind and any secondary use of the data must be at least uh, not incompatible with the primary purpose for which the data was processed. And big data analytics often involves processing personal data without any particular purpose in mind. And it uh, is not necessarily after lines of causation, but lines of association. Uh, so there's, a, there's a, a quite different mindset involved uh, with, with that sort of process than is assumed by present data protection uh, legislation. Uh, you also mentioned the problem of, of processing of aggregate data. And for, for those of you in the audience who aren't uh, experts in this area, it's important to note that data protection law only applies when the data can be linked back to a speci specified individual person. So you need to be able to identify a particular individual person. This is a, a rather strange... Uh, Okay, is that better? Uh, you need to be able to identify a uh, particular person, not a group of people, but an individual person from a particular data set for the data to become personal and for the data protection law to then kick in. So if you are only dealing with aggregate data, that is data related to groups, as Alessandro was, uh, was mentioning, then you are, in theory at least, outside the area of data protection law. And in, in, when I'm teaching this uh, field of law to my students, I always say, the first question you ask, if you're going to be a practitioner in this area, is, is there personal data? If there are no personal data, you don't need to worry about data protection law. And again, uh, big data analytics um, challenges this sort of assumption behind data protection law, because quite often, as uh, Alessandro said, you as the, the processor of the personal data, or, or, uh, you're not really interested in a particular individual, you're interested in, in the group characteristics and the group dynamics that you can reveal through big data analytics. Um, and you can presumably do a lot of that without having to worry about data protection law. On the other hand though, the picture is not that simple because the definition of personal data, at least in Europe, is also a very broad definition. So that personal data will be personal if there is a potential to make the link to a particular individual. If the potential is unrealized, that does not make the data less personal because the definition of personal data also comprehends a situation where you can potentially make the link, even if you don't. So if the potential is there, you have, in principle, personal data. And big data analytics is also resulting in a situation where more and more aggregate sets or data uh, sets of aggregate data are able to be linked back to particular individuals uh, because the analytics involved are more and more sophisticated. So what seems to be anonymous data through closer analysis actually becomes personal data. So the, 
the, the development is not, uh, is not that clear cut. It's, it's, it's cutting at least both ways. So in, in, in one sense, data protection law is being marginalized, but in another way, it is still potentially kicking in. But whether it kicks in with the right sorts of principles, that's another debate. My, my question actually concerns uh, one of the delicate interfaces between uh, data protection and the world of uh, public sector information and open data. Do you think that there's something relevant and new in the, in the proposed uh, uh, regulation that, that we should take into account? In principle, uh, public sector information and its opening up, which is on ongoing also thanks to European directive is, is done, I mean, with the full respect of uh, uh, data protection law. At the same time, the, the, the two words are clashing from, from time to time. There is, of course, a tension between the, the serendipity of opening up data for any purpose and uh, the purpose-bound word of uh, uh, data protection. So do you have any, any comments about this, this word uh, in relationship with the new uh, regulation? Thanks very much. It's a, it's a good question, and it's a question that I haven't really thought deeply enough, or sufficiently deeply enough, uh, sufficiently deeply about. Uh, as you say, there, there is definitely a tension between uh, the aims of, of uh, say, the, 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 the legislator when it comes to reutilization of public sector information, and the the containment goals of, of data protection legislation. At the same time, though, there is uh, also, um, to some extent, some, um, some similarities in uh, the rationale behind uh, open government initiatives and data protection law. And indeed, as you would probably be aware, and maybe some others in this room, uh, some of the data protection authorities in uh, Europe and elsewhere actually combine the two roles so that they are acting both as freedom of information commissioners and privacy or data protection commissioners. And I, I think that's actually, uh, that's, a, that's a, an approach that the Canadians uh, developed back in the 1980s. And I, I think it actually is fairly advantageous because it enables the commissioner or commissioner's office to see the two sides of the same coin and develop a rather holistic approach rather than just privileging privacy uh, rather than open government but trying to, to balance and see the complementarity in the two sorts of rule sets. On the other hand, I do note that my own home jurisdiction, uh, Australia, has just made moves to in fact decouple the freedom of information remit from the data protection remit so that we will go back to a situation where those two roles are uh, I I delegated to separate bodies. And I, I do think that's rather retro. <laughs> I don't think it's particularly progressive. Uh, it's more regressive. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, th th there was, if you're interested, there was quite a bit of work done by uh, Herbert Burkert back in the 1980s on the, the relationship between freedom of information on the one hand and data protection on the other. So if you want a theoretical framework for your analysis of this issue in the, in the 2000s, that's, that's a good place to start. Paolo Rainelli, uh, Polytechnic of Torino. I am uh, by no means an expert on this field, so maybe my, my question, my my point might sound naive or, or like uh, obvious, uh, but I just wanted to ask you whether uh, the whole issue of the right not to know 
uh, is addressed in some way in the proposed regulation because I'm aware of a big debate in particular in uh, insurance law, uh, insurance companies that are collecting very personal data irrespective of the kind of definition we are using for personal data such as uh, DNA test, uh, personal information that uh, need to be used by your contractual counterparty, the insurance companies, for instance, to know what's the risk in an health insurance to determine the premium and things like that. But the actual owner of the data, meaning the person uh, which, uh, which is the, 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 the consumer, the client of the insurance company, doesn't want to know at no. all. So is it something that uh, is it leaves to the interpretation of like insurance lawyers that most of the time are not, uh, or insurance law scholars which are not uh, expert of <coughs> data protection, uh, kind of becoming expert because they need to, uh, to approach also these issues? or it's something that the regulation, uh, this mammoth, is uh, trying to address in some ways? Thank you. Mm. Also a very good question. The, the, the right not to know is, in my opinion, uh, certainly at EU level, not a right. Uh, we can talk about an interest in not knowing in particular circumstances, but we don't have a, a general recognition of a right a legal right not to know. But it, do, it does come up as a particularly important interest in relation to genetic information particularly. Uh, I had a student who did an analysis of Norwegian law on point where we, in, in, in Norway, there is some legislation that prohibits insurance companies from asking for uh, genetic information and, uh, and indirectly then gives rise to a type of right not to know. But, but the student's uh, conclusion, and I would agree with her on this point, was that you couldn't talk about a fully-fledged right not to know. It was more a, an interest that was half protected by, by a smattering of rules in different, different pieces of legislation. And I think that's, that's probably the case in, in most European jurisdictions. So you could say that's a, that's a right that, or an interest that ought to be developed uh, more in the in the future, at least if there's a, an interest on the part of many people not to know their genetic makeup. But uh, the, the empirical data I've seen on that particular point is that uh, there's, there are many people who want to know if they are predisposed to develop a particular type of, of, of illness, amazingly enough. I guess I'm, I'm a person who would prefer not to know those things. Uh, you know, ignorance is bliss, in my opinion. Um, I don't want to be one of those uh, sick, healthy people. Uh, or, yeah, so, but that's, that's very personal. I don't know if there would be many people like me. I think many, many would want to have full transparency. second part uh, of uh, the, the symposium that is more based uh, on uh, the comparison between the different uh, attitude of uh, the regulation, uh, regulation sorry. Uh, okay. We have the second part now of the symposium that is based on uh, the role of uh, the data protection authorities and so on the regulation and the role of companies. Uh, uh, I want to add only an aspect. Uh, in the, this round table should be also represented the so-called uh, civil society or consumer side of, of the problem. And I ask to uh, La Quadrature du Net, uh, that is an association that is active in, uh, in France, uh, to be part of this symposium, also because they, have, uh, an extensive, they had an extensive uh, study on the lobbying effects uh, on uh, the proposal of data protection. But unfortunately, uh, the president of the, this association was not able to be present. And so we have a, a panel that uh, is more uh, um, authority versus uh, company, but I hope it became uh, authority and company, not versus company. <laughs> so thank you again to Lee uh, for your uh, keynote and also
for your kind attention to this uh, audience and uh, to be here in, in, during this visiting period at an access center and at Prolit. Thank you again. My pleasure.